Welcome to today's leadership forum, Prevent, Detect, and Respond, Securing Government and Education on Site and in the Cloud. I'm today's moderator, James Baker, Managing Partner of the Public Sector Technology Exchange. The Public Sector Technology Exchange is an independent forum that discusses the technology challenges impacting government, industry, and education. Learn more about us on the web or in your favorite social media venue. Before we get started with today's forum, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. One, today's webinar will be recorded and on-demand link will be sent to all everyone listening in today. Your questions are very important to us. You can submit those through the dashboard. We also got a multitude of questions coming in through registration that we'll try to get to. In the event that we don't get to your question, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the webinar. If you have a few minutes at the end of today's webinar, kindly fill out the survey. I'd like to also thank our sponsors. Today's event would not be possible without Palo Alto Networks and Proofpoint. If you would like to get in touch with Palo Alto Networks to talk about your security requirements, there's some contacts on the screen for you. Also, if you'd like to get in touch with Proofpoint State, uh, local and government and education team, their information's on the screen. It is my pleasure to have such an esteemed panel joining us today. I'm really excited about the discussion we're about to have. I also just have to make a, a few quick comments about today's lineup. There are a couple changes and I wanna make you all aware of them. Uh, Bob Leak this morning gave me a text and he has run into emergency. He uh, told me to send his apologies, but he cannot come on the live broadcast. I will tell you, uh, Bob and I texted back and forth. He's gonna come in the studio with me. And what we're going to do is record an interview with him. He has an incredible insight about the dark web, and I'll make sure to get that out to everyone. Also, uh, Mike Wants, CTO for the state of Illinois, was going to be on the panel. Mike um, had a situation come up this, this morning, and he has uh, uh, Chris Hill is stepping in for him. So, Chris, I'm glad that you're here with us, too. This is our portion of the panel where I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves and they'll tell you a little bit about them. We'll go ahead and start with Chris. Chris. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Hill. I'm with the state of Illinois. I've worked for the state approximately for the past 14 years. I've served as various roles here in the state of Illinois, mostly around IT management. Um, in the past 10, 12 months, I've worked in the Information Security Office for the state. We have been going through a journey here at Illinois through an IT transformation where we've brought all the IT resources across the state together. And hence, I have landed in the Information Security Office, and I'm glad to be with everybody today. Chris, we are glad to have you. Um, we're going to leave Illinois, and we're going to head out to Georgia. John, could you kindly introduce yourself to everyone? Thank you very much, James, and thank you, everybody, uh, on the call. Uh, yes, John Matelski. I'm the, def, uh, the Chief Info Innovation and Information Officer for DeKalb County, Georgia. We're the uh, third or fourth largest, depending upon whether you're looking at land mass or, or population in the state of Georgia. Uh, I've been in the realm of public service uh, in the public sector for over 30 years, starting out uh, at the, in the city of Orlando, then moving to Gwinnett County, Georgia, and then DeKalb County, Georgia. Uh, recently did a reorganization of my department where, and that's why uh, the title is innovation rather than just chief information officer, really the focus is now driving innovation and the security function is something that rolls up under me and I uh, have had the privilege and, and honor of working in the security industry for all 30 plus of those years as well. So again, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to, uh, to, to, to sharing some stories. Thanks a lot, John. We are going to leave Georgia and uh, go down 495 a little bit there, and uh, we're going to head to uh, Florida. Um, Lars, kindly introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us. My name is Lars Schmeckel. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Miami-Dade County. Um, Miami-Dade County provides services to about 2.5 million citizens. I've been with the county for approximately 15 years. During that time, I've had the responsibility for managing the county's network and infrastructure. And then about oh, 10 years ago, we um, 
we began the journey of establishing a formal information security program and establishing an uh, enterprise security office and I was asked if I would head that up and I have been doing that ever since. So it's been an exciting and uh, interesting journey and hopefully we'll be able to share some insights here today. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. We're going to leave uh, Florida and we're going to head over to San Diego. Gary, kindly introduce yourself to everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, like I said, I'm the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for the City of San Diego. I'm the first CISO that the city has had. I come from um, DOD. I've been with the city about three and a half years. I work extensively in the cyber community and the startup community. Um, the city has allowed me to be innovative and partner you know, and with various people, that's, uh, we've been building out our security operations center, and we're working heavily um, in the uh, industrialized IoT smart city space as the uh, city moves full on into being a, uh, a smart city. So we're looking at risk in all directions. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Dwayne, uh, uh, we're going to stay in California and just go uh, from uh, San Diego to where uh, Dwayne is up in the north. Dwayne, kindly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm uh, Dwayne Kuroda from Proofpoint. Um, I'm a group manager for Advanced Technologies. And as most people don't know, Proofpoint has things such as threat intelligence, uh, mobile security, uh, social media security, digital risk, and incident response. And that's sort of my area of coverage. Uh, Proofpoint as a company, of course, is one of the top rated firms for both the um, business email compromise, ransomware, um, um, and archiving as we're rated in the Gartner Quadrant. So that's, that's Proofpoint and myself. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, I'm going to leave California, and we're going to go to one of my favorite states. As someone who grew up in Maryland, I spent a lot of time in Delaware. Elaine, uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, Jimmy. Yeah, thank you. Very, very pleased to be on the panel today. Um, my name is Elaine Starkey. I am the Chief Security Officer for the state of Delaware. Uh, we are a small state, but we call ourselves a mighty state. Uh, I have been uh, at the, the job of being the CSO for the last 10 years, and my team is responsible for um, the enterprise-wide cybersecurity program, also responsible for disaster recovery and continuity of operations across all three branches of government, including our K-12 education network as well. My background is in software development. I started, I have a kind of a mix of uh, public sector and private sector experience. I started my career at Xerox Corporation in software development up in Rochester, New York, and I eventually made my way into the public sector, and I've been now with uh, the state of Delaware for the last 20 years. Very happy to be on the panel. Looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, now we're going to head, uh, we're going to leave Delaware, we're going to head over to Matt Morton at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Matt. Hi, Jimmy. I'm glad to be on the panel today. Um, looking forward to some of the great conversations around security and uh, protection uh, of, our, of our data. Um, I'm the first Chief Information Security Officer and Assistant CIO for the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Um, I'm an alumni of the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And I've been working in the industry, mostly in software development, for almost 30 years now. Um, I have a mix of corporate and uh, private, or excuse me, corporate and public uh, experience. And uh, I like to stay in touch with what's going on by teaching. And I do that because the students that are working and getting their cybersecurity degrees are certainly uh, active in uh, helping me uh, understand what the latest uh, hacks are and what the things that they're going after are. So look forward to talking to everybody today. Thanks, Matt. We're going to go ahead uh, and head uh, back down to Georgia. Uh, Walter, kindly introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Jimmy. I, I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, I come out of the, of the military background, been working for the state for the last 17 years, where I've been working uh, here lately on cyber intelligence. Before that, I've had experience in putting together the state cyber preparedness program. And then even before that, I'm now uh, working on, uh, I guess, the governor's uh, initiative for cyber innovation and training center. It's uh, been a long journey for us at the state. And I've been with them, like I say, 17 years. And it's, I've been with in security for that time. So I've seen the changes. 
I've seen the improvement and also seen the, uh, the, the challenges uh, arise. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Rick, uh, please introduce yourself. Hey guys, uh, I'm, my name is Rick Howard. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Palo Alto Networks. Um, I'm overall in charge of security for the company, both physical and cyber. I run the threat intelligence team here called Unit 42. And it's been a good portion of my time uh, just talking to people about how they do security. So I'm very interested in how this conversation goes. Thanks, Rick. And actually, uh, Rick, if you'd stay there for a moment, I'd like to open up the first question of today's forum, and I'd like you to answer it, and then if any of our panelists would like to comment. But Rick, could you share with our audience the story of ransomware and how cybercrime has changed over the last few years? Yeah, I think everybody on the panel will agree that ransomware has significantly changed the landscape. Uh, you know, cyber criminals before ransomware became prevalent, you know, were pretty much restricted to credit card fraud and so the target list was small compared to the rest of the world. But with the advent of ransomware becoming a commodity thing that cyber criminals do, now a potential victim is anybody that has a computer because they can ransom that person behind the computer to get money out of them. And I do have a war story. Um, Palo Alto Networks belongs to a information sharing group of security vendors called the Cyber Threat Alliance. And last year we were doing research on a ransomware campaign called Crypto Wall 3, and the way this ransomware campaign worked was they targeted the grandmas of the world. They would go after grandma's computer and encrypt her hard drive. Once they got that done, someone from Eastern Europe would call grandma on the phone and tell her that if they, she wanted her pictures of her cats and her grandkids back, that they would she would have to pay $500 in Bitcoin. So just pause for a second, everybody on the phone, uh, have you ever done a Bitcoin transaction? And if you did, how long did it take you to do the first one? I'm thinking for the panelists here, maybe a couple hours to get all the pieces together on your very first one. So the professionalism of this cyber criminal gang who could walk a grandma through a Bitcoin transaction in a second language to the tune of about $325,000 in revenue in about 90 days. And that's a low estimate. We think it's probably closer to 700000 We just couldn't prove it. So that's how good these cyber criminals are, that they can walk a grandma through, that kind of a thing. Now, just to close the story, the Cyber Threat Alliance did the research and uh, published a white paper on the indicators of compromise for this group. Uh, what do you think the adversary did the day after we published the white paper? Well, they moved to Crypto Wall 4. Well, and now we didn't make them go, they were ready to go, but we bumped them, and that's the whole point of the Cyber Threat Alliance, that we make them, we make the adversary uh, react to what we are doing as opposed to the other way around. And truth be told, about two months later, the adversaries behind Crypto Wall 4 abandoned the platform because it really wasn't ready for prime time, and they moved on to something else. So we're going to take credit for both of those ransomware campaigns. So that's my war story. That is incredible, and uh, like we said, uh, cyber criminals are going after grandmothers now, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll joke in aside, I've actually spent some time even with my mom going through with her, you know, what to open and what not, and we're actually going to talk in a little bit, um, not right now, I, I want to see if anyone else wants to comment this, but Elaine has some real creative ways too that they've been, um, you know, getting the message out to seniors, but would anyone else like to, uh, before we go to the next question, comment, you know, on uh, you know the history of ransomware and how cybercrime has changed over the, over the last years. Well, I, I would like to go to another question, and um, we're going to go over to uh, uh, Gary Hayslip in San Diego. Gary, I, I'd like to talk about smart cities and cybersecurity. You spoke recently about this at RSA, and my question for you, and we have a couple slides that I'll I'll put up for our audience while we're talking is. With all the moving parts in the city of San Diego, how do you address risk? Um, I use Palo Alto firewalls. And I use quite a lot of them, actually. No, um, you know, actually, it's um, when I originally started it, it was uh, 
really taking a look at risk, you know, from a 30,000 foot view and then down really up close and personal. And it was, you know, doing a full assessment and getting an idea, you know, maturity wise where we were at and then uh, breaking it down and actually uh, putting together a, a three year timeline of projects of where we were going to uh, start maturing our security controls. And a lot of it was, you know, hardware and software issues that we needed to put in place or workflows that we needed to put in place. A lot of it was visibility of the data. Um, the biggest thing was, I mean, I had a, a really good discussion with the mayor and uh, explained to him that, you know, we're going to take breaches, you know, that, you know, cybersecurity is a life cycle and breaches are part of that. But if we wanted to go ahead and be resilient and be able to absorb breaches and not go down so we could still continue to provide services, we needed to go ahead and have cyber as the first thing that we should be looking at. And so we started uh, building out the security operations center and they let me be flexible. So I started partnering with startups and bringing in new technologies and, uh, and they let me be flexible and work with a lot of my vendors and you know, and bring in uh, technologies to handle some of the new you know uh, IoT you know solutions that we started seeing. You know, for me, it's a constant process of continuous monitoring, uh, continuous assessment, continuous scanning, continuous remediation. Um, you know, we use NIST and and specific frameworks to you know give us guidelines as to where we're going, and then partners. You know, like Palo Alto, I, we work with them extensively. Uh, you know, for recommended changes and stuff for different types of traffic that we're seeing. And my biggest thing, and I've written articles about it, is I look at trying to integrate everything. You know, I don't want anything being standalone. I want to be able to tie it together as a platform, you know, so I can look at, you know, real-time threats and then over time I can look at, you know, um, behavioral, you know, analysis of threats and things that we're seeing. Yeah, and this slide was um, after we did our, our whole um, assessment, I broke down a, um, a three to four year timeline as to where we needed to be at. And, you know, uh, looking at risk, looking at projects, you know, prioritizing controls and what we needed to work on. And I actually briefed this to city council and the mayor staff so they could see where we were going. You know, I wanted them to understand that I was actually following, you know, a, a framework and guidelines and to give them an idea that I wasn't dumping all of the stuff on them. We were going to take a look at our issues. We were going to break it up. Um, and they gave me the flexibility to partner and start working, you know, with a lot of our, our different vendors and a lot of our startups to uh, start addressing our issues. And we're just now into uh, the advanced stage, starting part three, where I'm getting ready to do a whole new three-year you know, assessment. And then this slide here is a lot of our ongoing projects we're doing, uh, data governance, the IoT behavioral analytics, that startup uh, actually just got bought by WebRoot recently. But we're looking at um, IoT and how the devices talk to each other and seeing these clusters of data and movement of data through the networks. And uh, we're tying a lot of it, like our the network behavioral analytics, that system, we're tying a lot with our Palo Alto firewalls to really see threats and attacks real time, you know, so that we can, you know, learn how to respond. And the data governance side, uh, that's another platform that we're using to move security down to the data layer. You know, we've been, uh, I'm really looking at, the vendors and all the different people that we're working with and where our data is at and how it's being accessed and what's being used. And, you know, it's, uh, it's really critical for us as we bring in a lot of our new IoT devices and they're being connected to the networks and stuff and we're building out a lot of the smart city technologies. We need to have visibility on you know, how they're being maintained, what we can see, how the updates are being done, you know, how we're, you know, where the data's going, you know, and so, uh, you know, for us, it's a continuous process, this platform that we have everything linked together. Thank you, Gary. Um, anyone else want to comment on uh, smart city initiatives before we go to the next question? Actually, I, I had a question for Gary, and, and first of all, see, I'm impressed with all the work that he's done and he's put up there. Um, in most in most cases, when we talk to um, organizations, you know, state and local, about smart city initiatives, they're usually low on the budget. They're trying to pilot things. They get grants for pilots, but they usually don't have sort of the budget and the structure set up to have security. So I think it would be good for myself and everyone on, on this call. Is how did you, you know, convince everybody that security was part of the the, the whole program versus just you know doing a pilot and seeing this is neat stuff. 
Well, I mean, I can tell you what happened with me was uh, when I started, I think my budget was about a half a million dollars, and three years later, I've got a budget of about four and a half million. And you know, a lot of it was, um, you know, originally I came to the city after just finishing the executive MBA program at San Diego State, and so I'd worked extensively with startups and everything. So uh, when I got here and I realized I didn't have a lot of money, you know, I'm working with these startups that want a partner you know, because they want us to help them with their technologies. And so, you know, I got the city to agree that, you know, hey, we'll do a memorandum of an agreement, an NDA with them, that they get to use the city's networks as a test bed. I get the technologies for free for a year. My teams will help their teams, you know, as they're developing. I get visibility into what's going on so I can better protect our assets. And at the end of a year, if we decide to keep them, um, I want at least an 80% discount. You know, and I'll talk to their VCs to get them funding. All of my startups have stayed with us, you know, and um, and so we're always looking at new technologies. But they've let me do things like that to go ahead and bring in new technologies. And then what I started doing was um, I also am very active in the cyber community. I write, I uh, present, and so a lot of my partners that I work with, you know, I'm like, you know, you got to hook a brother up here. I need help. I'm a city. I don't have a lot of money, you know. Um, and so I, you know, I basically said, you know, hey, I will evangelize and work for you, but you need to help me. And so we do these partnerships where we can get discounts so I can get the technologies I need to protect my city. And we're, it's a partnership. You know, I'm willing to help them. You know, we work together. And so, and then I work a lot with uh, DHS and with the FBI and with the fusion centers, with MSI SAC. And, you know, I pull services in where I can. Um, you know, to build out my program, and I write about it, and, you know, I share a lot of the information with other municipalities that I talk to and, and kind of show them roadmap-wise where I've been and what I've been building out. Excellent, excellent. Any other uh, comments on that before we move to the next question? Yeah, so this is Lars Schmeckel from Miami-Dade County. Um, similarly, we work with our business units, and as they begin to... Uh, um, propose some of these smarter city initiatives. Um, we have been pushing the security review um, earlier, much earlier into the process as they're beginning to have the discussions and the visioning sessions of what they want to do uh, so that we can take a look to see how their vision of what's going to happen um, and what they want to execute on can fit into our existing cybersecurity architecture and how we can best work with them to secure these initiatives. Um, too often in the past, what we found is the departments would be going off on their own on these initiatives, and then at the last minute, they'd have something that uh, they would bring to us and say, this is going live on Monday for the mayor, and we need to get it um, published to the web, or we need to have access to it. And, uh, <laughs> and then it becomes a mad scramble. Uh, so. By pushing the, the security awareness into the earlier, into the inception of the process, has helped us um, come to an agreement with the uh, with the various departments out there um, and the smart city initiatives. Well, Lars, actually, hold tight a moment because um, I wanted to actually talk to you um, about an aspect of the smart city initiatives. But as we do that, I just one of the things I want everyone listening into, you know, Miami-Dade County is comprised of approximately 26 departments and agency. Your, your team handles the fifth largest 911 dispatch in the country. You have a seaport, an airport. Additionally, you're monitoring security prestigious prisons and other personal rec record taxes. Can you share with us right now, um, you all have some real innovation going on in what I would call the uh, rail systems and critical infrastructure. Can you give us some examples of what you all are doing with smart city uh, initiatives in your state? For example, you know, a, a question might be, you have a huge amount of traffic. How do smart city initiatives work, say, with your just your bus and rail system? Right. So. From the county's perspective, transportation and the transportation plan has been um, a, a really uh, a well thought out and, and adopted plan to improve 
um, transportation for the citizens because traffic congestion is a big problem in Miami-Dade County as it is with many other major metropolitan areas. Uh, several years ago, our traffic management system was an old antiquated system. Um, they literally had a, a traffic map of Miami-Dade County on the board with lights representing the traffic lights on there. I mean, it was an analog board that would tell the traffic management folks when a light was out or when it wasn't. Um, and uh, about six years ago, they decided to modernize that. Um, and we worked very closely with the integrator initially on how that was going to occur. Um, and one of the thing, one of the first things that, that came up in the conversation was that um, they were taking a look at this and, and they said, this is traffic management. And I, I looked at them and I said, guys, this is really a traffic SCADA system. You don't call it SCADA, but it is. And we need to provide some type of protection um, for the data between the controllers and, and the back end systems. And we were lucky enough to have a partner that understood the need for security, worked with the security team on implementing that. And then gradually that morphed into, as, um, as you alluded to, we have a, a heavy rail system. We also have a light rail system. And we have a, a very large bus fleet um, for citizen transportation. And that was also undergoing and is undergoing right now. Um, an operating system upgrade. So as, as we have implemented the new advanced traffic management system, now there's an opportunity for us to say, okay, what can we do to ease traffic congestion? So we have selected um, potentially six, up to six primary corridors within the county uh, where we want to integrate the two systems. They were formerly in different departments. Now they've been joined together in the Department of Transportation, so traffic engineering and the Department of uh, Public Transportation are now a single entity. And they want to share information between the two disparate systems so that what they're looking to do in this instance is on those express bus routes that we have, um, they want to have the, the buses will be reporting data back in real time as to their location um, and the traffic conditions. And then what they will do is, as a bus approaches an intersection, they will then communicate back to the advanced traffic management system so that if that traffic light is going to go to red, the bus will request that the traffic signalization system keep that light green so the bus, the express bus, can pass through that intersection. That aids us in much better planning from a, a bus perspective and eliminates what they call bus bunching, which is if you see on some of the bus routes, you'll see like three or four buses arrive at the uh, bus stop at the same time. So that, that's not a very efficient use of resources. So we're trying, to, we're trying to spread that out to make a more efficient use of resources on these express routes. And then the express routes are designed to take them to perhaps um, some of our transit hubs where the, the, the citizens can transfer to a different mode of transportation, our heavy rail system, which um, traverses to multiple uh, locations throughout the county. And the, the, um, the whole challenge there is how do we secure the entire system end to end? Um, we also have from a Smarter Cities initiative, uh, there are some additional traffic solutions that we're looking to implement. So as we implement the um, and roll out the advanced traffic management solution at the intersection, we're now taking a look at implementing high def video cameras. And those video cameras will feed back to our traffic operations center. And they'll be implementing some video analytics on those uh, video feeds that will pop the screens up before the operators if they detect uh, traffic congestion based on the number of cars that are passing through there. We're also doing some really cool stuff with integration with uh, um, user reporting apps. So we have just signed an agreement with Waze whereby we will be getting Waze feeds as to the traffic conditions that are fed into our traffic uh, management center as well. So all of those um, all of those points of interface and entry into the system provides us with uh, a challenge on how do we do that securely? How do we ingest the information from third-party people securely? Um, what are the what are the potentials there for abuse? Right. So there's there's gaming of the ways system. Right. People want to want to keep their street 
free and clear of traffic, so they begin reporting that there's traffic congestion there. Um, so these are all things that, that we're taking a look at. Um, Thank you. From, from some other uh, smarter cities, we're, we're also implementing some what we call technology for good with uh, providing residents in some, uh, in some of our areas with free laptops and internet connectivity to see if we can allow them to uh, bridge the digital divide. Uh, we have some smart lighting initiatives um, within some of our housing areas. And uh, finally, we also have some video analytics that we're taking a look at to deploy at some of our parks so that we can see, is there somebody in the park after hours that shouldn't be there? And then will that information be shared with our um, operations, the, the, uh, the police operations center so that they can dispatch somebody out there? And potentially we're taking a look at the possibility of facial recognition in the parks so that as people come and go into the parks, can we identify folks who shouldn't be there, um, folks who may have a, a criminal um, history of uh, sexual predator, and if we can identify them through facial recognition and then potentially dispatch somebody to take a look at that. Excellent insight. Um, we just had, you know, Laura's comment on smart city initiatives and what they're doing. Uh, I, I want to move over to another set of questions before that. Any other comments from the panel? All right. We're going to head over to Matt Morton. Matt, we have um, we have a huge audience from all over America dialing in, and we have you know federal, state, and local government. But we also have a lot of higher education institutions in K through 12. And one of the questions that I have for you is that the K through 12 environment, higher education, are very different than corporate and government. You know, the goal of education, in a sense, is to collaborate and learn. In an environment where students have multiple devices and they demand access to data 724, what are some of the security challenges facing higher education? And if you could, you know, comment about, you know, your environment and where everyone's bringing their own device. Sure, sure, you betcha. So, you know, that's certainly, you know, you kind of outlined the challenges that we're facing right there. I mean, they're not just bringing one device, they're bringing three devices. They're bringing a tablet, a phone, a laptop. Uh, they're utilizing many of the uh, same things that uh, we all use in our everyday lives. And, and with that, uh, you know, they're not necessarily protecting them. They don't necessarily have antivirus on those personal devices. And then they bring that onto our networks. So we see a lot of botnets, we see ransomware, we see uh, a tremendous amount of increase recently in account compromises. And, uh, you know, they have Google accounts or Yahoo accounts, they use the same password across all those. There's varying levels of uh, understanding and abilities in those areas. Um, the budget is also kind of uh, creating issues. There's a lot of pressure on higher education, as there is on cities and and uh, other organizations. But, you know, you got to show value. You got to demonstrate value with funds that you get, and you got to make sure that the IT supports what you're trying to do, but at the same time is protected and secure. And, and that stuff, you know, with all due respect to our friends at Proof Point in Palo Alto, it's not cheap, and uh, uh, it works very well, but it isn't cheap. So let's let's talk also too. Um, you you had mentioned the uh, botnet attack. I think you know everyone listening in. At the end of last year, we all saw uh, Deutsche Telekom in Germany, you know, have the Mirai botnet where it really attacked you know every aspect of the Internet of Things. Comment on that, please. You you bet you bet. So I mean I think as we all saw, I mean I I, I received a phone call on a Friday that my Netflix wasn't working in my house for my kids, and so. Then it impacted me personally, but but it impacted a lot of people with a lot more uh, uh, impact, I should say, financial impact, like Netflix and Amazon and some other places, because that bot took down uh, some pretty important services that people are relying on. Now, uh, as it turns out, we happen to be working in this space uh, at the university. We've got a research center that's focused in on it. We call it cyber physical. Um, that cyber-physical relationship 
Uh, and, you know, I think uh, Lars and Gary both kind of referred to some of this kind of stuff. You've got smart cities. You have all these Internet devices. I mean, we have clocks that are connected to the Internet. And uh, uh, what we're doing is we're trying to learn more about these things, partner with people, uh, companies, to come in, uh, work in our research center, test their devices, use our network as a test bed. Uh, they may get to see some things on our network that you wouldn't necessarily see in a corporate network. Um, we're, we're fixing that, but but that is the case. And then, uh, you know, kind of develop protocols and assessments and all the things that are not there necessarily yet for operational technology that we've been doing on the information technology side for probably a good 10 or 15 years now. Um, our most recent project, you know, is actually protecting our irrigation system on campus, which you might think seems kind of monotonous, not a big deal. On the other hand, most of our food that is grown in this country is uses an irrigation system of one factor or another. So there's a huge opportunity, unfortunately, both for the hackers, but also a good opportunity to protect uh, these systems that we need to as they relate to food production and uh, and water. Hey, Matt, okay. this is Rick. Do you, yeah. do you find that as you look at the security of those systems, um, the IOT side of the house. Are you trying to invent new ways to secure those things or are you using traditional tools uh, to do it in a, in a different way? Well, I, I would say probably both more, more likely. So what sometimes will happen, for example, with the irrigation system, you know, there'll be a controller uh, spread out every two or three heads of the irrigation system. And then there's a main uh, server that controls all the controllers, right? So you have to have kind of a distributed uh, protection uh, system, not unlike maybe when you would when you have a bunch of laptops on a network, but it still takes a little different coordination. You have different network protocols. You know, you've got uh, SCADA, you've got other things that are going on this uh, ICS network. So there is some, some things that are slightly different. I find that conceptually, though, they're roughly the same controls. In other words, you're looking at the device, and if you can't protect the device, then you go to the next layer, right? Uh, and you go work your way outside that ring to kind of protect that from being compromised and attacked. And then also and then the monitoring that you need uh, to be able to monitor to see if these are reaching out and uh, are they trying to do other things. You know, a lot of times we have a hard time sometimes explaining in higher ed to our uh, esteemed faculty uh, that when they uh, provide an opportunity for a hacker, even though they may not have any data that's of value, they're providing a pivot point, right? And, th and that pivot could be the pivoting to something that is valuable, and that's what we don't want. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Rick. Yeah, it does, and because I, as I go around talking to people around the world about this kind of stuff, it seems like a many of the network defenders view this is a different space that they need to come up with a different way to protect those environments. And I always thought, you just need to do the same as you're doing with your regular environments. It's a little bit different, for sure, like you said, different protocols and things. Yeah. It's the same yeah. idea of putting multiple prevention controls down the kill chain. That, that is, that's still sound, right? That's what, I'm that's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, yeah, no, that is still sound. The, the only difference might be is that when they invest in something like an irrigation system or or, uh, you know, heating and air conditioning, you know, that's a 20, 30 year investment sometimes, right? Or, e or even food production um, equipment, you know, any manufacturing equipment. So then the systems or the software that comes with that sometimes is not upgraded over that period of time. That's, that's more where the challenge is, I think, is, uh, is the, the operational technology has a much longer lifespan than the typical information technology. So I like that. I mean, um as network defenders, we're pretty familiar with, you know, traditional internet traffic. Uh, we could do a better right. job on SCADA traffic for sure. And But your point about those tools are going to be in place for 20 years without an upgrade, that's a very interesting point. Yeah, yeah and that's uh, typically something that we've seen here at Miami-Dade County as well. These, these tools were implemented a long time ago. Um, the operating systems are typically not even supported by the OEMs anymore. Uh, it's just supported by whoever the vendor was, and they are extremely reluctant to do any type of patching or um, any type of risk mitigation on these systems. If we think about the, the CIA triad where confidentiality, 
um, integrity and availability, it gets kind of turned on its head from a SCADA perspective. Their most important aspect of that is the availability of the SCADA system because that is very often a life safety issue, right? Um, but again, when we talk to the vendors and we say, hey, we want you guys to upgrade this, they say, well, you know, we, we can't. We, it's not certified to run on that level of operating system. So we have to come up with how do we isolate and, and try and uh, secure those communications. And even then they say, oh, no, it's an isolated SCADA network. And it turns out that it, it really isn't once we get in and do a risk analysis or a, or a risk assessment for them. Yeah, that's right. Excellent point. And just for the audience listening in, we're about at our halfway mark. Um, I have five more questions I want to ask our panel, and then we'll begin to open up things to uh, you, the audience. Riveting discussion so far, and I appreciate everything, everyone's insight. Um, I'd like to move over to uh, Elaine. Um, Elaine, I have a couple questions for you. There are a lot of myths about the cloud. You know, ultimately, the cloud saves money, but there are some risks that come with it. Could you share with us, um, you know, what must be projected in an enterprise when you're moving to the cloud? Sure. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we've we've embraced the cloud here in Delaware in in a fairly big way. We we unveiled a new uh, cloud first policy um, several years back, about four or five years back, and and what that means is it, it doesn't mean everything goes to the cloud, but it means that the cloud is considered for every single new initiative. And as you know, as my colleagues on the panel know, that just by nature, we in government collect a lot of personal data. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, there's just lots. I, I contend that our bar is, is higher than, than even some private sector organizations. It, whether it's birth records or death records, tax data, criminal justice, health, payroll, HR, it's just, you know, like it or not, it's the job of government to collect data and store that information. And until recently, we stored it mostly on-prem. Um, so, you know, we've taken a real deliberate approach. Um, it, it, I call it our journey to the cloud. Someone mentioned that, you know, the journey earlier, but it has definitely been a journey for us. Um, you know, starting with the position of, oh my gosh, no way am I going to ever send that kind of data to the cloud uh, to where we are today, which is a very deliberate, um, methodical approach to, you know, getting that data out there. And, and thankfully, the cloud vendors have matured uh, to a point where security, um, we can have very reasonable discussions and, and talk about our terms and conditions and and set forth our terms and conditions, and for the most part, they are typically agreed to. So ultimately, you know, I think it's my job to ultimately be uh, accountable. The buck stops here for that, the protection of that data. I'm delegating that responsibility, though, to the cloud providers that we're working with. It's a really, um, really interesting perspective. And, you know, I'd like to uh, chime over to uh, Walter Tong in, in Georgia, because, Walter, you all have actually outsourced a majority of your infrastructure. Could you, could you comment on that, please? Yeah, certainly. Um, like Elaine, we are moving uh, uh, into the cloud uh, for uh, business reasons and as well as for uh, protection. The things that uh, we, we store now are a lot of our emails. We store documents uh, that from the agency that are inside our uh, outsourced uh, contract. And I think that, uh, um, the, as, as Elaine said, that the maturing of the cloud has been a great aid uh, in, faci in facilitating our move into the, that uh, environment. So I find it a, a great uh, business uh, advantage, and uh, as well as a, a more secure one than when it first started. So uh, uh, I was very uh, skeptical of that cloud at the beginning, but now I've, I've learned to embrace it. So uh, it's, it's part of that journey uh, and getting there. Absolutely. And, it, and it is a journey. Jimmy, if I may, I mean, I, 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 I agree with Walter so much. It, it, it's almost um, kind of baffling to think that. We, and we were probably all in the same spot where we, 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 it was like, no, 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 you know, 
hate to be the department of no, but no way can we send this data to the cloud. And and now, uh, you know, I I catch myself in meetings saying, if we don't get this to the cloud quickly, we're going to be less secure <laughs> than uh, if we, uh, you know, we, we're to keep it on prem. So it's just a, a fascinating evolution that I would have never predicted. Hey, Elaine, this is Rick. Are, are you guys uh, doing uh, platform as a service or infrastructure as a service or a little bit of both for all your cloud stuff? Yeah, all of the above, um, and and over 300 and some software as a service as well. So it's uh, our terms and conditions. Um, you 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 may be familiar with the the T's and C's that we started with. We were very thankful and grateful to the Center for Digital Government. They they actually took those T's and C's and and weaved it into their best practices guide on cloud procurement, and they did a fine job in in kind of creating an appendix for each of, of the as-a-service models, um, SaaS and, and IAS and, and platform as a service too. Can you, can you talk about um, the shared responsibility model that many of those cloud providers have, meaning that they do some of it and they expect the customer to do some of it? Uh, what is your experience with that? Yeah, I, I think that's um, I think that's very been very helpful to us because and certainly as we've moved from the software, we our our journey started with just a lot of vettings of the software as a service, and we all of them kind of came through my office, and the ones that had the most critical data were the ones that I personally got involved in. But um, as we as we move over to infrastructure and platform, though, it, I, I agree 100%. It definitely is this shared responsibility. But in the end, there's things like, um, in our case, you know, some of our important terms are, you know, the data ownership. Um, we and 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 typically we get very little objection to that. We want to be very clear that while we're we're Setting up in, with this type of engagement, the, the state of Delaware retains ownership of this data throughout the life of the engagement. Uh, we want to make sure that that data stays, you know, on, in the United States as well. So that that's part of our dialogue with the vendor as well. I mean, there's a number of things that that we sign up for, and likewise, I expect our, our vendor partners to sign up for too. So it's very very accurate to call it a shared responsibility. Thanks, Elaine. Um, I want to shift gears and uh, talk a little bit out, and I'm going to ask Chris to comment on this. And well, in comedy, you know, all of us have, uh, that are in security have the obligation to uh, inform people. And you know, Elaine State, I'm showing some slides. I love the Did you know? And they do everything they can to get out there and talk to people. But Chris, um, and then Elaine, if you want to comment too. But Chris, uh, I want to head over to. to Back to Illinois. How do you all educate um, on the, uh, your, your citizens, your students, on the importance of cybersecurity? Well, I, I think as a state, we need to be able to share those resources and be best practices with the educators, educators, and the, and, and uh, the public as well. Um, not only the importance of the cybersecurity, but the examples of the best practices that are that are available to us through the frameworks and stuff that we referred to earlier um, with this, this, and those. Um, pieces of material that are available for us to share to the educators and to the public. Um, in, in the state of Illinois, we have various agencies, we have outreach programs that go into schools and show how students can proactively protect themselves, um, you know, and, and engaging in social media and the other things that, that students do. Um, you know, I think earlier Matt um, kind of alluded to the, the fear that, that, that's out there with what the students do and, and how they use their IDs and ID management, um, passwords and restrictions and devices um, very um, unsecurely. Let's, let's just leave it at that. So, um, so, so we, we, we try to do that, you know, with the, with the outreach programs, at least try to educate them as much as we can. So. Um, and, and then here at the state, I think, you know, we're trying to, be a little more proactive with our cybersecurity strategy and and getting our workforce to be more cyber secure, um, proactive um, uh, monitoring that we're doing, and then trying to just do some education here to our our employees. You know the the 50,000 employees that we have 
um, oversight over um, better cyber hygiene. We're also um, enabling to be secure at home as well, so they understand a little bit more when we're doing our education modeling. Of this not only affects you at work, but it affects you at home. So um, I, I read an interesting um, article the other day. It was a cyber security from the boardroom to the living room, and it really, really kind of hit home, you know. So uh, it's it's an interesting time. So I'll just leave it at that. So. Thank you, Chris. Um, I have a, a just a, I have a question for Dwayne and uh, John before we uh, try to get to some of the audience's questions. And yeah, you know, Dwayne, um, let me ask you this. Uh, bear with me just a moment as I as I move forward. I'd like to talk about the difference between security policy versus security reality when moving to the cloud. You know, when organizations move to the cloud, maintaining policy has some hidden challenges. Could you talk about this? And I'm going to put up a couple slides that you've uh, provided us about some recent uh, reports that Proofpoint did. But again, could you talk to us about the difference of that? Sure, sure. There's a couple of different ways that we see it apply in, in the, the worlds of our customers. Uh, the first one is, is just talking about the, the way you protect, the way you communicate. So one of the, the things that we do very well, Proofpoint, of course, is um, the email factor, right? And when people are dealing with email, um, when people move to the cloud, we've seen this. Uh, you've got one vendor who's all on-prem, then you've got one vendor who's in the cloud. And when people make that transition, what actually happens to that data? Can you maintain that, uh, that email provider? Do you have to do a full transition? Do you understand uh, the ownership, the encryption, the uh, protective rights of all the, the email messages that happens in that transition. Um, on top of that, when people move to the cloud, sometimes we see a sort of a breakage in, in policy, whereas the policy might apply in the cloud and in spirit you have the same thing happening on-prem, but when you make that transition, uh, very few vendors, well, very, very few um, uh, organizations, whether it's state, local, or, or even EDU, uh, they will typically not move wholesale from you know from on-prem systems to the cloud. There's a little hybrid mix mode where they test and verify and they scale it up. And in that process, we've seen a number of companies um, uh, uh, get challenged because they want to maintain that ownership of that of, of the customer, but the technologies they have in place don't allow for that to happen. And so there's a, a there's a mail routing problem, there's a security problem, there's an encryption problem. Uh, there's a continuity problem maintaining, you know, reliability. We talked about accessibility um, being available all the time. And so when, when those things kind of break down in that transition, then people um, get exposed to weaknesses of either vendor, which might be phishing, the ransomware, uh, the business email compromise that happens uh, that we've been seeing more and more. Thank you, Dwayne. Any, anyone else uh, care to comment on that? I think, Jimmy, if you can step back to that Wi-Fi wi slide one, one quick second. Uh, oh, one I'd more. be happy to. Give me just a moment. Is that, is that is yeah, the one we're so, looking for? So the, the, the other one I want to talk about was um, sort of Wi-Fi. So what, what people talk, you know, we talked about you know, what you do at home versus what you do at work. Uh, well, one of the, the behaviors people have learned at work is uh, set up your phone or mobile device or laptop to hook up to an SSID, right? And then your, your tools understand what you're connecting to and how it works. Um, and as a professional, that's that's sort of reliable way to get your business done. But uh, you know, we've done some research uh, that actually parallels what happened at the Democratic National Convention, where people set up uh, fake hotspots and people just you know hooked up to it. Uh, we had some researchers who just were at I forgot which which uh, airport it was, but he turned on a rogue high hotspot uh, and gave it three SSIDs: Google Wi-Fi, AT&T Wi-Fi, and Xfinity Wi-Fi. And at least 10% of the people within, you know, uh, 20 feet of him had automatically connected to his Wi-Fi hotspot, right? But it was just wow. one of our researchers, and unfortunately, our researchers are guys who work with malware, right? So, so if, they, if they're making a mistake and they had done this and they were working on their their, their malware research, you could essentially be uh, or potentially be hacking that that Wi-Fi connection. So what you learn to do at work, and then you do that on your spare time off off the the, the corporate network. Um, it does not apply in the same way that you thought it did, because anybody can spoof a, um, a hotspot SSID, and then there's all these ways that they can get in. They can strip your data. They can modify your pages. They can do all kinds of other nasty things. It's an excellent, excellent point. Um, anyone else care to comment? That I have a question I want to uh, ask John in uh, DeKalb County, but anyone else care to comment on 
on that, you know, the difference between uh, policy and security reality before we go to our next question with John. All right. Well, I think everyone listening in today, and I want to thank our audience uh, from all over the country for uh, has stayed with us this entire presentation. I think we all agree it's no longer a question of if you're going to get breached, but when. John, a, a year ago, your county had a proverbial powder cake situation where you were dealing with public upheaval and threats from anonymous. Can you uh, share with us a little bit about this story? Sure. So I, I'm honored to serve the DeKalb County and its citizens, and I'm thankful to say that we have one of the best public safety um, teams in the country. However, I think all of us are aware uh, that when law enforcement personnel um, get engaged to any scene, you know, they become volatile, and you never know what's going to happen, and decisions are made, um, you know, in the heat of the moment, and they may not always be the best decision. Obviously, we're all aware of the hacker group Anonymous. Um, back in 2002, they engaged in an attack. Uh, I think it was their first one against a, a municipality was in Boston, the police department there. Uh, more recently, they had Operation Anaheim in 2012 in Cleveland, and I think that was in the same year. All of us know uh, in August, I think it was, of 2014, we had the Ferguson incident. So, you know, denial of service attacks and Twitter attacks and, and uh, just attacking various resources of, of, of government and other institutions. Um, we had an unfortunate incident, incident where we had an officer involved shooting in January of 2016, and we did receive a number of threats from, from sources that were purported to be from anonymous, um, and they were threats uh, against our infrastructure. We prepared ourselves for the worst and did see a significant increase uh, in attacks, uh, attempted attacks and exploits. Uh, thankfully, none of our systems were compromised. Uh, and whether it was anonymous or not, uh, we can, we're not going to know for sure. Um, but the good news is, despite the increased volumes of attacks that were coming in, because we had layered security uh, and it performed as it was designed, we were able to fend off uh, the, the influx that, that, we, that we had. Um, also, having a website vendor that has monitoring tools in place that will help minimize or mitigate denials of service. That's really, really important. Um, if you're doing self-hosting, um, you, you really need to be working with very closely with your internet providers uh, that provide you your pipes to, to make sure that you have policies and procedures and processes in place that would help facilitate overcoming uh, a denial of service attack like that. Uh, thank you, Rick Howard and Palo Alto Networks. Uh, we are a Palo Alto Network shop as well, and we have a good team in place that is works 24/7 really to monitor intrusion preventions and systems. And, and again, we do it you know with that layered security uh, in mind. So I'm not so naive as to think that any government or institution uh, can fend off all attacks. But the key really is making sure that you've done your due diligence. Um, with all of your systems, whether they be on-prem or cloud-based, um, and, and making sure that you really put yourself in the, in the best security pro uh, posture as possible. I think another key is to, to really get engaged um, with other folks within your industry and outside of your industry. Uh, you know, we get engaged with, with PTSE here, uh, and, 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 you know, security uh, events such as this are, are, are very helpful. Getting involved with user group activities. Um, I'm on the board of directors for the Fuel user group, which is the Palo Alto Networks user group, 14,000 members strong. We get together and share best practices and lessons learned, and that way when we have attacks like this or potential attacks, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And, and again, having great relationships with your vendor where I can call in uh, to any of the vendors within our, our ecosystem, I think that's really, really key. So making sure you've got policies and procedures in place and you're working very closely with your vendors and, and in this case with the law enforcement community as well. Interesting story. I appreciate you sharing that. And um, one of the things John mentioned, too, is Ferguson, Missouri. If you go out to the PST's website, we had Mike Rowling on um, uh, last year and the year before, and he goes into detail what happened with that uh, unfortunate incident. And 
how it impacted security, but excellent uh, point. Well, I want to thank our audience. We are right now about 10 after the hour. I'm going to ask our panelists just to stay on a few more minutes. There are so many excellent questions that I want to ask you all, but this is, um, and, and maybe we'll, um, this might be just kind of like closing comments and last question. We'll, we'll start with um, Walter Tong. And my question for you all is this. You know, there was a myth uh, about, you know, is security in the cloud better than security on the perimeter? So, you know, Walter, you're in a situation uh, where you, you've outsourced a lot of your infrastructure. So, so I'd like our panel just to comment on security on the cloud versus uh, uh, security, you know, physical security in your uh, perimeter. Walter. Sure, Jimmy. For me, I think it's better in the cloud um, because in my instance, I have a world-class uh, service provider that has a 24-7 team uh, dedicated to uh, securing that, uh, that environment. So I find it uh, much more advantageous uh, to have it there than it is to try and uh, staff a, a group of security professionals to do it uh, ourselves for the state. So my vote is definitely for the cloud. Thank you for that. Let me just um, go around the horn here. And uh, Chris, any uh, closing comments or, or comments on that last question? Give me a... None at this time. Sorry, I was on mute there. I, <laughs> I was talking to you guys and nobody was there. Uh, no, none to know. Thank you. I appreciate that. John. Yeah, so the only thing I would say, uh, and, and we were a latecomer to the cloud. Um, when I got here in DeKalb about four years ago, that's when we started to make our transition. And, and, mm -hmm. and we also are now cloud first, have a cloud first strategy. But for those of you who have a boards of directors or commissioners or, or, or whatever, I think what sold the viability of the cloud solution to my administration and board was the following truth, which is cloud vendors, you know, like Amazon, Oracle, Microsoft, Google, insert company name here, um, they spend more on security probably in a day than most government or educational agencies can hope to budget for in a year. Um, and so as long as it's implemented correctly, as long as you have service level agreements and contractual uh, requirements built into, a uh, real quick example is, we don't want our data going off um, out, outside of the country. So these companies have you know, data centers across the world. In our contract, we've built in stipulations saying that our data can only stay within the 48 contiguous states. So mandating that as a procurement requirement, ensuring that that re requirement is in all your contract language with all of your cloud vendors, um, I think that really is, is critical. And I think it would be naive to think any more this day and age that just because you've got um, a box uh, on-prem that it's more secure. The reality is um, these, these vendors spend tons of money uh, on security, making sure that our data applications infrastructure are secure and I agree with, with my colleagues here that, that the cloud first is the right approach. Lars. Oh, this is Chris. I, I wanted to add one thing in there as well. The resiliency side of, of the cloud is, is very phenomenal as well. So I think keep that in mind as you move forward in that initiative. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Lars, closing comments. Uh, comment on the uh, you know security in the cloud versus perimeter. Sure. So from the county's perspective, we, we have not been um, very, I don't want to say aggressively, but we haven't, we haven't been moving forward uh, for production systems per se into the cloud. Um, we've been taking some tentative steps. We've been moving uh, our client base from an Office 365 into the cloud. We have some tentative development going on in both AWS and Azure. And one of the key factors is that you need to have a security strategy in place on how you're going to secure your cloud environment, working with your cloud providers, working with the security team, making sure that you have the processes in place so that as systems are spun up and spun down, um, they meet the security requirements um, from your security architecture that you've designed so that you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to have the Wild West out there where developers are spinning up systems that don't meet the minimum security requirements or um, that they're allowed to, you know, do things their way, right? Uh, we want to be an enabler of technology. Um, as Elaine said, we don't want to be the department of no. 
Uh, we want to be the department of how can we do it securely. So it's all about working with the customers and working with our service providers to do that. The other thing that I would mention is when we take a look at our cloud service providers, we're taking a look at how do we connect with them. Um, distributed denial of service attacks were mentioned earlier. If the county experiences a significant di distributed denial of service attack, how is that going to affect us and our uh, peering partners? And what can we do to segregate that traffic from the regular internet traffic so that if something like that happens, um, we can still access the applications and services from our cloud providers. Thank you, Lars. And uh, just for everyone listening in, we're right at the tip of the hour. We're just going to ask for a few more minutes of your time. Uh, I know Matt Morton just sent me a, a little note that he's got to head off for me. Matt, I didn't know if you were still on the line or you had to uh, move to your travel time, but uh, if you wanted to say a quick few words before you headed off for the no, meeting. Great. No, thanks I just wanted to thanks, uh, Jimmy, for the time, and uh, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciated learning uh, from the peers here. You know, we use Palo Alto and Proofpoint both, and uh, couldn't be happier with those products. They've certainly saved a lot of my uh, time and a lot of my staff's time. So um, thank you, everybody, and I appreciate it, and look everybody up on LinkedIn, and we can communicate that with you. Matt, and I, I hope to have you back on because I tell you, we didn't get time to talk about telephony denial of service. We all know about DDoS, and that's just, uh, I, I think we could all go probably another 45 minutes on that, but thanks for coming. Let me jump back to uh, final, uh, final kind of, uh, Gary, um, just any final comments for our audience regarding, you know, the cloud security versus your, your perimeter? Um, I think, you know, I echo what everybody else is saying about cloud and that, uh, you know, the city looks at the fact that we're a, we're moving cloud first. We virtualized uh, all of our servers and on the vBlocks and, you know, uh, and got out of, you know, owning our own data centers, you know, several years back. You know, that's just not, you know, what a city is supposed to be doing, you know, with uh, the funds that we have. Um, so we have an extensive private cloud infrastructure. We're already doing a, we're moving a lot of our development to uh, public cloud. We're working with a lot of our partners to uh, incorporate cloud as much as possible. So it's, you know, the um, the old, you know, the old view of security being on-prem, you know, is definitely going away. It's more, you know, for us, it's definitely a, a hybrid, you know, side right now. But you know, and we are, we're constantly looking at you know, the various applications, solutions, the different things we're working on, what is cloud capable and what or what is going to, what, you know, resources is it going to take to make it cloud capable? And so, yeah, we're, we're definitely embracing that. Thanks, Gary. Dwayne. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I iterate what everyone else is saying, but I'd like to throw this little piece of uh, this little nugget here. Um, as people are talking about the cloud, uh, private cloud, obviously the, the most secure, uh, the public cloud, one of the things that we, we tell people to look out for now, um, there's an increased attack on um, SaaS providers and their registration and credential phishing around that. So while it is generally more secure and easier to manage, um, you just have to have the plan, as, as was said earlier, to make sure you understand um, how credentials are managed and used. And on top of that, um, if there's an, a single sign-on vulnerability, which could then spread and make you um, uh, victimized by multiple SaaS applications tying to that single sign-on. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Elaine. Wow, yeah, uh, not much more to be said here. I did a, <laughs> did a, <laughs> to what I heard. I like what I heard very much. I, um, you know, I think what's important is it can, <clears throat> at least my position is the cloud can be more secure. The, the important words there are can be. It really requires some real, a real deliberate approach and I would encourage our listeners jump in the driver's seat. You know, don't let the don't let the vendors drive you, but let you know you drive. You know what your business needs are. Hold them accountable. Make sure security is an early part of the conversation. And in the end, um, you know that results uh, that can result in a win-win solution for both sides. Yeah, and if you need some creative ways to inform your citizen, uh, Elaine does everything from food trucks to out with uh, seniors and libraries, so she has some really neat ideas on that. We're going to go uh, for the last word here. Uh, Rick, uh, please comment. Yeah, just two quick ones. Um, if you think about AWS and Azure, uh, just reiterate the shared responsibility model. Both those cloud providers are providing security down to their bare metal servers. 
everything else is on the customer. You guys have to figure out everything up the kill chain from there. There are, there are uh, products and services you can use to do that, but just make sure we all understand that it's a, it's a two-step process there. And the other bill it is for the SaaS stuff, the new, relatively new technology that's come out is something called CASB. It's a way to monitor your SaaS providers so that uh, all those things, when you're designing your security program, you have a way to kind of monitor uh, those providers you are uh, partnering with. But I do all of this move to the cloud as a big opportunity for uh, network defenders out there. All those things that you used to hate you had to do in your old on-prem services, as you transition to the cloud, this gives you a chance to get it in the right way that you've always wanted to get it done. So uh, with all the cloud providers being providing better security services, this is our chance to get some things done right, and I'm pretty happy about that. Thank you, Rick. And then uh, looking on your screen right below, Rick, is uh, Bob Leak. I mentioned that Bob couldn't be here today. He's going to come into the studio with me in about 10 days, and we are going to record. He has some really interesting insights on the dark net that will certainly put out to everyone listening today. I would like to thank you, the audience, for joining us from all over America. Uh, there uh, special thanks to our panelists. I'm sure you can hear the virtual applause going all around the country. You all were just uh, brilliant. I wish we had a little more time. I had a lot more questions to ask you. I also want to thank our sponsors today, Proofpoint and Palo Alto Networks. I'd kindly ask you all just to take a few minutes and fill out the event survey. We'd like to hear what you're thinking. Please join us. We have some upcoming forms. You can read those on your screen, both webinars and physical events. If you would like to get in touch with the Public Sector Technology Exchange, either sponsor a form or join us as a panelist, my information's on the screen. And again, if you're interested in talking to Palo Alto Networks about your security needs, their team is on the screen. If you'd like to get a hold of Proofpoint, their government and education team is on the screen as well. I want to thank you again for listening into Prevent, Detect, and Respond. On behalf of the Public Sector Technology Exchange, I'm James Baker. Make it a great day.